Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Just what comforting words was Paul referring to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Well, just listen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He encouraged them to rehearse this event in their minds so as not to be disheartened and fall away under the trials of everyday life. Let's also gain comfort as Pastor Mark Byers expounds more on this triumphal event in his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. This morning I'm asking you to do a miracle. A miracle of speaking through a human body and causing human ears to absorb and understand your word. I pray that you will speak clearly. And give us a vision of things eternal. That we might be a people ready for the coming of the Lord. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. What we are looking at right now is the thought of being ready for the coming of the Lord. What are we to be doing? As we have seen, God has promised to completely deliver this world and us individually from the curse that has laid hold of this creation. But we've seen that with all the blessings and promises of God, there are always conditions. Conditions that we must meet if we want to inherit those promises. Quite frankly, the blessing of Christ's coming is based on us being ready. Those who are not ready, it will not be the blessing they had looked for or hoped for. The fact is that the only time we have to get ready is now. It's not something we can put off. We're going to turn to the scripture today, a little bit later, concerning the virgins, the foolish virgins. But if there's one thing that those foolish virgins learned, they learned that it was too late to buy the anointing when they waited too long. They had waited till the day of purchasing it was over. In the scripture, Jesus gave an end-time parable. And at the end of the parable, he says to the servants, Occupy till I come, or do business till I come. And what we are looking at in this final number of messages is, what are we to be occupied doing as we are waiting for the coming of the Lord? Quite frankly, I believe that everything I'm sharing could have been preached in A.D. 100, A.D. 500, A.D. 700, or A.D. 2003. The first thing that we looked at was that we are to be pursuing personal holiness. And quite frankly, holiness is a major key to being prepared for the coming of the Lord. Today I want to move on that we are to be walking in obedient faith. One of the things that we have failed to see in the scripture in this present generation is that the gospel is not the good news about how to get saved. That does a tremendous disservice to the message of the gospel. The gospel that Jesus preached is the gospel of the kingdom of God. He did not come preaching the gospel of how to get saved. He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He came preaching that we are to be living in a certain way. That word kingdom of God in our terms and in, in our society would be better translated, he came preaching the gospel of the government of God. He came preaching the gospel of learning to be governed by God. John the Baptist preached that gospel. The apostles preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. It includes how to get saved, but it is far more concerned on how we live after we're getting saved and how we are to live after we've accepted Christ. According to Jesus' teaching, being his disciple means that we are following him, we are doing his will, we're seeking to please him, we're doing what he loves, we're loving what he loves, and we're being about the Lord's business. It means that we are following the Lamb whithersoever he goes. It means we've taken up our cross and we're following him. We're denying ourselves. We're denying ourselves the right to be ruled by ourselves. We embrace the truth that we're not our own anymore. We've been bought with a price. 
And of course, the price is the precious blood of the Lamb of God. Jesus made the statement, he who is not with me is against me. But he went on and says, and he who does not gather with me scatters. You cannot be halfway between a disciple and an ungodly person. You are either gathering with the Lord, doing his will, pressing toward the mark, or you're scattering. That's what Jesus says. The idea that you can be lukewarm is a fallacy. The scripture clearly says that the lukewarm Christian will be spewed out of his mouth. That means vomited. The scriptures are very clear. We have been created by God to fulfill a specific purpose. And he has a divine intention for your life. And the whole purpose of Christianity is to find out what that intention is. The book of Acts tells us in chapter 17 that we have been placed on this earth for the whole purpose of seeking him. It says in verse 26, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. Jesus said to us in Luke, the 11th chapter, I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. The literal verb tense there is he who goes on seeking. He who goes on knocking. He who goes on seeking will be the one who goes on finding. It's a continual sense. The idea that you can make a a single decision to follow Jesus and be ready for the rapture is simply not the truth. It's not the way the Bible teaches it. When we come to the end of our days and this creation is invaded by the presence of the Lord, there's not going to be a single person with an excuse for not choosing the way of the Lord. Even the creation itself, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, is revealing the purposes of God for our lives. But if we're going to please God and we're going to know God, there are two things that we have to have functioning in our lives. Two things that we have to be walking in. One is faith and the other one is obedience in the area of repentance. Faith and repentance. The Bible says without faith we can't please Him. And the Bible says that we are to repent and be converted, that our sins might be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. We are to be seeking Him while He may be found. We are to be calling upon Him while He is near. And we are to forsake our way. And we are to forsake our thoughts. And we are to turn to the Lord and He will have mercy on us. That's what repentance is. It's not enough to have heard and at some point in our lives made a declaration that we believe in the message of the gospel. That is heresy. The idea that you can make a decision and say, I believe the gospel is true, and then just go out and live in such a way that disobedience is the hallmark of your life is simply a lie that is from hell. The Bible makes it clear in the book of Hebrews chapter 3 that obedience and faith, obedience and believing are used interchangeably. They didn't enter in because of unbelief. They didn't enter in because of disobedience. That's the way it's declared. Many people have been told that all they have to do to go to heaven and be ready for the rapture is at some point in their life declare they believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. All they have to say is a sinner's prayer. Make a decision to say a sinner's prayer. Acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and they're all ready for the second coming. Listen, the word repentance means turn around. It means about face. It means go a different way. In fact, in the book of Acts chapter 18 and 19, the Bible calls the Christian faith the way. It's a way of living. It's not just a decision that we make. It's the way to life and it is the way of life. It's very clear in the word of God, we can't earn our salvation with works. But I declare to you, if you don't have works, you don't have salvation. If there are no works in your life, there is no salvation. And if there are no works of righteousness, we are not prepared for the coming of the Lord. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But it's so amazing to me how very often we fail to even know what the next verse says. How many of you know what the next verse says? Isn't that amazing? We get so taken up with that scripture. By grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And that that verse is you see, it's all grace, no works. The very next verse says, 
For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's saying, yes, you're saved by grace. There's not a thing you can do to earn the salvation that God has provided. But once you've received it, you better have works or you don't have faith. Philippians says that we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling because it's God that's working in us. Ephesians tells us that we're to walk worthy of the calling wherewith we've been called. We are to live in such a fashion, Ephesians 5 tells us, that we be a sweet-smelling aroma unto the Lord. He tells us to walk as children of light in verse 8 of Ephesians 5. In the book of Isaiah chapter 30, 21, he says that we're going to hear a voice behind us saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. Isaiah says that the unclean shall not pass over this highway. The idea that we can live unclean, disobedient, rebellious lives and be prepared for the coming of the Lord is just simply a lie. And there's a lot of people that are not going to make the rapture because of it. We'll see some of those in the scriptures in a few moments. James tells us in chapter 2 very clearly, Someone will say to you, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. He goes on and says, do you believe there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. In the very context of the idea of having faith without works, the Lord through his own physical brother, James, the, the apostle, that he writes and says, listen, the demons even believe. Are the demons going to go to heaven because they believe? The demons believe. And they even tremble at the name of Jesus. But they're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire because there's clearly something between Believing and then working out our salvation. Verse 24, he says, you see then, listen to this verse. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. There are people who are so deceived in believing that we don't have any works. They probably don't believe that's in the Bible. That verse clearly says, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. James 2, 24. And then finally he says in verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. If we don't have works, we have no faith. If we do not have works of obedience, if we're not walking in obedience, and we're not walking in the obedience of the faith, we don't have faith. As clear as can be. Scripture is very clear in this matter of obedience to the Lord. Do you realize that the essence of salvation is surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Romans 10, 9 in the New American Standard Bible puts it the best way. For if we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess that Jesus is your Lord and your life proves that he is your Lord, you're going to be saved. Here's some scriptures that I want to quickly read because I want to get into the meat of the end time teaching that I want to deliver today. John 14, 21 says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest, apocalypse myself to him. Daniel 9, 4, And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who who keep his commandments. If God keeps mercy and covenant with the people who don't keep his commandments, that's a stupid statement. Just plain an empty, empty promise, empty declaration by Daniel. God is clearly telling us that he keeps mercy and covenant with those who keep his commandments. John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved to my Father. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keep them, he it is that loves me. John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 1 John 3, 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he has given commandment. 1 John 5, 2 and 3, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God. Listen, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. You know, people say, oh, I love the Lord. And you look at their lives and say, well, then why are you doing this? Oh, well, that doesn't matter. I love the Lord. Listen, 
according to the authority of John, the beloved apostle who writes about the second coming in the book of Revelation, he says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Don't tell me you love God and you can't keep his commandments or won't keep his commandments. If you love God, he says, you will keep his commandments. This is the love of God. I am so tired and weary in my spirit. People say, oh, I love the Lord. And they're living hellish lives. And they're not ready for the kingdom. And the worst part is, there are preachers by the tens of thousands telling them they're okay. They're deceived. No wonder Jesus said four times, many, 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 many will be deceived. Because we are living in an hour when deception is rampant. And people think they're ready for the coming because they've made some careless little pressed prayer under the impetus of music and under the impetus of a, of a friend to accept Jesus and they're living hellish lives and they're on their way to the devil's hell and they don't even know they're not saved because they're not keeping his commandments. Clearly the Bible makes us know that Enoch was a man who was a type of the rapture. But notice that it says of Enoch, Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. He was walking in obedient faith when he was taken. He goes on in Hebrews 11.5 and says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. That's one of the prerequisites of being part of the rapture. We must have faith functioning in our lives. It must be functioning present tense. Not some simple little prayer we made 25 years ago. It's not enough to simply become a believer in Jesus. Like I said earlier, the demons even believe in Jesus. The issue is do we believe and obey? In Matthew 22, turn with me there. Jesus is beginning to move in Matthew 22 toward his teaching on the second coming. We're going to stay in Matthew, basically the rest of this morning's message. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says in verse 8, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. We can back up a little bit so you get the concept of what this parable is about. Matthew chapter 22. This is the parable of the wedding feast. Verse 2, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged the marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. How many of you realize he's speaking here to the Jews specifically? Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all the things are ready. Come to the wedding. He's telling them, come to the wedding. You're my bride. He's telling Israel, come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. How many of you know that's exactly what we saw he did last week to the city of Jerusalem in their temple? Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. We all know it's a commonly accepted biblical teaching. This is a reference to being invited to salvation. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And let me say this to you. I wonder how he got in there without the wedding garment. How did he even get that far? Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Are you aware with me that the book of Revelation interprets what the wedding garment is? It tells us in Revelation chapter 19, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Isn't it amazing? It didn't say that the fine linen was the faith of the saints. It says the fine linen that she has made herself ready with is the righteous acts of the saints. The bride will be ready for the wedding and given a garment that are the righteous acts of the saints. 
She makes herself ready by the way she lives. No wonder Jesus, through John the Baptist, said, Therefore bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. In the book of Acts, Paul said, Do works befitting of repentance. Jesus gives us in Matthew 24 the signs of his coming, and we've looked at them quite extensively in the last number of weeks, what the signs of his coming are. And as he ended the signs, he begins giving three parables about the second coming. Now I want to say this very carefully. He gives these three parables... And he begins telling his disciples what they are to do to be ready for the coming. Now I want you to listen real carefully. I'm going to make a statement that might confuse you as I first say it. But I will explain exactly what I mean. As you already know, I do not believe there is a rapture with seven years of tribulation followed by the second coming. As I said to you in one of the very first classes, I think the very first class, eight months ago, nine months ago, when we started this whole series of teaching on the second coming, I challenged you to give me two verses in the whole Bible that says that there's a seven-year tribulation. Just give me two. Recently, I was at a pastor seminar where I was the speaker, and I was asked to teach this subject, and I taught this subject to these pastors, and there was probably 80 pastors present. And the first thing I did is I said, I know some of you believe certain things, but I want to ask you if you would please give me a slip of paper. If you believe in a seven-year tribulation, please give me a slip of paper with two verses on it that proves there's a seven-year tribulation. Many of the pastors there believed in a seven-year tribulation. I knew they believed that. That's why I asked them for the slip of paper. At the end of the week... I still didn't have a single piece of paper with two scriptures on it. In fact, I didn't have a single piece of paper with even one scripture on it. And the reason is because there isn't a single verse in the entire Bible that establishes that there is a seven-year tribulation. And we have been fed a false doctrine that we have embraced without even checking to see what the Bible says. There is no such thing as a seven-year tribulation. Last week we explained Daniel's 70th week to you. And there is clearly no seven year tribulation. There is a three and a half year period. And that's the only period the scripture refers to in relationship to the last days. And at the end of that three and a half year period, there is going to be a catching away of the saints. We are going to meet the Lord in the air. We've already looked at all this. We're going to be transported to Jerusalem by the angels to meet the Lord over the Mount of Olives and the wedding supper takes place. Now listen, once we are raptured and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we are transported and changed and meet the Lord over the Mount of Olives, over near the east side of Jerusalem and we meet him in the air, the scripture is very clear that the marriage supper takes place. So that there is a short period of time between the actual rapture of the church and the apocalypse or the appearing, the manifestation, the revelation of Christ to the world. Between the rapture and his appearing, there is a marriage supper that lasts for a season. Not months or years, I don't think. I have a suspicion it's more than one day. I think that the Lord has been waiting for the manifestation of that day so that he can have his wedding. And I don't think the Lord's going to carry off a wedding in an hour and get it over with and have a reception. I think the wedding is going to be a wonderful event. What I want you to understand is we are raptured, the wedding supper takes place, and then we come back immediately with the Lord. So there is a short period between when we are raptured and when we come back at his revelation. Welcome you to Kingdom Living with Pastor Mark Byers. Let's get right to today's message as Pastor Mark continues his series, The Second Coming Reexamined.
There isn't a single verse in the entire Bible that establishes that there is a seven-year tribulation and we have been fed a false doctrine that we have embraced without even checking to see what the Bible says. There is no such thing as a seven-year tribulation. Last week we explained Daniel's 70th week to you. And there is clearly no seven-year tribulation. There is a three-and-a-half-year period, and that's the only period the Scripture refers to in relationship to the last days. And at the end of that three-and-a-half-year period, there is going to be a catching away of the saints. We are going to meet the Lord in the air. We've already looked at all this. We're going to be transported to Jerusalem by the angels to meet the Lord over the Mount of Olives, and the wedding supper takes place. Now listen. Once we are raptured, and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we are transported and changed and meet the Lord over the Mount of Olives, over near the east side of Jerusalem, and we meet him in the air, the scripture is very clear that the marriage supper takes place. So that there is a short period of time between the actual rapture of the church and the apocalypse or the appearing, the manifestation, the revelation of Christ to the world. Between the rapture and his appearing, there is a marriage supper that lasts for a season. Not months or years, I don't think. I have a suspicion it's more than one day. I think that the Lord has been waiting for the manifestation of that day so that he can have his wedding. And I don't think the Lord's going to carry off a wedding in an hour and get it over with and have a reception. I think the wedding's going to be a wonderful event. What I want you to understand is we are raptured, the wedding supper takes place, and then we come back immediately with the Lord. So there is a short period between when we are raptured and when we come back at his revelation. Not three and a half years, not seven years. It's at the very end. Turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 19, and I will show you that from the word of God. In chapter 18, Babylon is destroyed and fallen. In the first part of chapter 19, all of heaven is having a time of great worship and praise because Babylon is now destroyed. Verse 5, Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. You know why he heard the sound of many waters? Because that's the sound of heaven's worship. It's a flow. And the reason we worship in the song of the Lord the way we do is that's the closest natural thing we can do on this earth to match heaven's worship. Let us be glad and rejoice. Now listen, and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. How many of you recognize that voice came from the throne? This person that was talking to John is clearly someone who was redeemed. And when John went to worship him, he says, I'm your brethren. I have the testimony of Jesus. Don't worship me. Worship Jesus. But I want you to notice what verse 5 says. Then a voice came from the throne. Whoever this person is, he inherited the promise. Whosoever overcomes shall sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father on his throne. Whoever this individual is talking to John, he overcame and was seated on the throne. And the voice that is speaking to John is a brother who is on the throne. Do you see that? That's a staggering, staggering truth. But I want to go beyond that. You see, he says, the marriage of the Lamb has come. The marriage supper is taking place. He says, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper. If blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper, those who aren't called aren't blessed. And so the marriage supper takes place. Then I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Guess what he's getting ready to do? Armageddon is about to take place. 
His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now notice this. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen. How many of you realize we were told what the fine linen is just a few verses before? These are not angels. These are the righteous acts of the saints. These are the saints who have been redeemed. The ones on the white horses with him are the church who have overcome. The ones who were just raptured. The ones who were just part of the marriage supper. They are coming back with him. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. We are all going to return following his white horse on horses because we're going to be part of that great battle called Armageddon. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself shall rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now listen, listen to what happens here. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. This is not the marriage supper. That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Against him and the army following him. Who is the army following him? It's the saints who were raptured that took part of the marriage supper and rode white horses behind him as he returns to conquer the earth. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. The rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. What happens in the book of Revelation? The marriage supper takes place. The Lord then turns comes riding on a white horse with all those that participated in the marriage supper who were dressed in fine linen, and they come back with him also riding on horses. The word goes out of his mouth, and he destroys all the armies gathered in Armageddon. It's not even a war. And notice they came against him and those who were with him. Now, the catching up of the church, the bride, to the marriage supper, precedes this coming in judgment by a short period. The coming is called revelation, manifestation, appearing, or the Greek word apocalypsis. Turn with me to Matthew 24. Now we're going to be able to understand Matthew 24. Do you understand that there is a rapture, not seven years before Armageddon, not three and a half years before Armageddon, but a rapture with a marriage supper and then Armageddon. That's what the Bible says. Now I want you to read with me Matthew 24. Starting not in the beginning, but in verse 37. It would be unfair to even teach on the second coming without addressing this issue. He starts in verse 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whose master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing. 
Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How many of you are aware, as we read that section, that six different times he did not refer there to the rapture, he is referring there to his coming? In verse 37, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 39, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 42, what hour the Lord is coming. Verse 44, the Son of Man is coming in an hour you don't expect. Verse 48, my master is delaying his coming. In verse 50, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him. Now, how many of you are aware, as I said last week, there's no division between the verses and chapters in the Bible in the original text. We read chapter 24 and it's, we finished our chapters to get through the Bible for the year and we put the Bible away and lay it down and we basically pick up chapter 25 tomorrow night. There's no division. And I want you to notice the very first word of the next chapter. Then. Then. Then the kingdom of heaven will be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Then. Then. When is he referring to? When is that then referring to? What has he just been saying? He's been saying, he has just said six times that he's referring to his coming, his apocalypse, his revelation, his manifestation. He said it six times. He goes on and says, Now five of these virgins were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Uh, how many of you know that no man calls Jesus Christ Lord but by the Holy Ghost? He just got through telling us that the kingdom of heaven is like ten virgins. He answers and says to them, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Do you realize that his statement to those virgins was in reference to his coming, not his rapture? The rapture was already over. Did you catch that? He tells this kingdom end time parable about ten virgins. Five of them are ready to go. Five of them are not. They are all part of the kingdom because he says that the kingdom of heaven is like ten virgins. All these virgins were waiting for the bridegroom. All these virgins had lamps and all of them had some oil. The problem was those who didn't have enough oil recognized it too late. They recognized that they didn't have time to pay the price to get the anointing. They recognized they had goofed around and played games and were lukewarm and didn't have time to get the anointing. They didn't have time to prepare. It was too late to prepare. The wise had been preparing all along. It's not that they didn't have the money because the moment the wise said to them, go and buy, they went to buy. Whatever it took to buy, they knew they had it to buy it. But they had wasted time and weren't buying it when they should have been buying it. One of the things we should learn from these ten virgins is that it's going to be ultimately too late to pay the price to be ready to meet the Lord. We need to get the anointing in our lives now. The reason why we stress worship so much is because we are convinced here at Calvary, and I am convinced before you through the word of God, that the key to his presence is you enter his gate with thanksgiving and his court with praise, and that's where you get the anointing in his presence. You come before his presence with singing. 
If the statement, assuredly I say to you, I do not know you, means that these people weren't saved, it's in direct contradiction to the very first thing he said about these virgins. He says, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins. He's referring to ten virgins that are part of the kingdom. What he's saying is they didn't have a love relationship with him. They had allowed the cares of this world to choke out the true riches. They had failed to pick the good part like Mary. And they were literally allowing other things to come in and crowd out the riches of the kingdom. They weren't dwelling in the secret place. They weren't preparing by seeking the Lord while he may be found and calling upon him while he was near. They were simply living out their lives with the cares of the world controlling them one day after another. You know what we do with verse 13? With verse 13, we take it all the way back to the beginning of the discourse of Jesus. The problem is, verse 13 is spoken to the foolish virgins. He says to the foolish virgins, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. What has he been talking about for the first, well, since verse 37 of chapter 24? He's talking about, listen, the coming, the coming, the coming. The coming is going to be like the days of Noah. The coming is going to be a surprise. No one's going to be aware that the coming's taking place. It's the coming, the coming, the coming. He says it six times. And then he says, then, then when? When the coming takes place, it's going to be like this. And then he tells us the story of the ten virgins and says there are five wise and five foolish. The five wise are ready for the rapture. They go to the wedding. And when they go to the wedding, the five foolish come, want to get into the wedding. And the door is shut. And they call Jesus Lord. And he turns to them and says, I don't know you. There's no intimacy between us. And then he says this to those five foolish virgins. Oh, if you can just grasp this. In the name of Jesus, listen to what he says to those five foolish virgins. He is not going back and talking to all the disciples. He is still talking to the five foolish virgins. And he says to the five foolish virgins, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. The rapture is already over when he says it to them. Are you getting what I'm saying? The rapture is over. The door to the wedding was shut. They were trying to get into the wedding and the Lord says, you're not getting in here. They've called him Lord. And then he says to the five foolish virgins, what's therefore for you do not know the day nor the hour in which the son of man is coming. There was a marriage supper taking place and he's saying, you've missed the marriage, but I'm coming back. Make sure you're watching this time. Make sure you're ready for my coming. You weren't ready for the rapture, but my coming is coming soon. And you be watching. Because when I come back, guess what he's going to do? Armageddon is going to take place. And if you think that everybody goes in the rapture that's going to be in the millennium, who's going to bring forth all these natural children that the millennium speaks about? Who is the bride going to rule over if everybody's ruling? Who are these nations that are going to be ruled over by a rod of iron through those who overcame? I'll tell you who they are. They're the foolish who were not qualified for the wedding. And he said, my coming is going to be in an hour and a day you don't think. The day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord in one place doing one thing, seeking God. And you're going to tell me that we're all going to be just busily going about our own little business When the rapture is about to take place and we're going to have no idea in the spirit that it's about to happen. We're going to know. And those who are ready are going to have their lamps trimmed and burning and waiting. Knowing it's drawing nigh. Luke says this. Chapter 12, verse 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he returns from the wedding. That when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Who are these people who are supposed to be waiting for him to return from the wedding? If there's nobody here on the earth who wasn't a believer. Go back to Luke chapter 17. Keep your finger in Matthew 24 there. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. 
We just read Matthew 24 where he says, As in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In Luke 17, verse 26, he brings up that same topic because there were Pharisees who were wanting to know if it was time for the kingdom. And he tells them, if they say, see here or there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you, don't believe it, don't go out. He said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there, do not go out after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of the one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now we're talking about the same thing, I think. Don't you? They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, go back there. Matthew chapter 24. It says, And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Now there are those who teach that that means they were raptured. But notice what he says in the book of Luke. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came, and it didn't say took them all away, it says, and destroyed them all. The ones taken, like in the days of Noah, according to Luke, are destroyed. Who's taken and who's left? The ones taken, according to Luke, are destroyed. Not raptured. Likewise, as it was also in days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And because of that verse, they say, see, Lot went out, they were destroyed. Well, the problem with that is this. When is the wicked destroyed by Jesus at his coming? When do the wicked find themselves destroyed by the coming? We aren't left with any doubt about that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4-10 to 10 tells us, and it says this in summary in verse 6, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed. And you know what that word revealed is? Apocalypsis. When the Lord is revealed, when the apocalypse takes place, when the Lord is revealed from heaven, when the coming takes place, when the manifestation takes place, when the revelation takes place, the word revelation, manifestation, appearing, and apocalypse are all the same word. They are all translated from the word apocalypsis. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. When does he destroy the wicked? When are the people of Sodom going to be destroyed? At the rapture? No. At the second coming. At the revelation. And what's going to happen is the marriage supper takes place. The Lord Jesus comes back with his armies, which is the bride riding on horses. They too riding on horses. They descend onto the earth. They move into Jerusalem. The Armageddon armies come out against them. And with a word out of his mouth, the Lord destroys those armies. And the wicked are destroyed. Who's left? Those who missed the rapture, who called him Lord. That's who's left. Those who were not qualified to rule and reign. Do you think for a moment that God's going to allow people to rule and reign over the earth that can't even rule and reign over their own flesh? He's going to let us command the nations when we can't even command our own households after us? We can't even tell a five-year-old what to do and he'll obey us and we're going to command nations? Dream along with me. He's going to have people who have learned his ways, do things his ways, and they are qualified to rule. If that wasn't the case, we'd have the same mess we already have then. 
He's going to have a company of people who have overcome and they and they alone are going to rule the nations with the rod of iron. And who are the nations? The foolish virgins who wouldn't get the anointing and do things his way when they had the chance. The apostles gave us direction with regard to the return of Christ. James said, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. Peter wanted us to set our hope fully on the grace to be given us when Jesus Christ is revealed. Paul reminded the suffering Thessalonians that God would pay back trouble to those who troubled them when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven. He told the Philippians their citizenship was in heaven and that they should eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are people of God's Word, we too will have the same mindset. Let's join Pastor Mark Byers as he brings us more insight on this important event in his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. When does he destroy the wicked? When are the people of Sodom going to be destroyed? At the rapture? No. At the second coming. At the revelation. And what's going to happen is the marriage supper takes place. The Lord Jesus comes back with his armies, which is the bride riding on horses. They too riding on horses. They descend onto the earth. They move into Jerusalem. The Armageddon armies come out against them. And with a word out of his mouth, the Lord destroys those armies. And the wicked are destroyed. Who's left? Those who miss the rapture, who call him Lord. That's who's left. Those who were not qualified to rule and reign. You think for a moment that God's going to allow people to rule and reign over the earth that can't even rule and reign over their own flesh? He's going to let us command the nations when we can't even command our own households after us? We can't even tell a five-year-old what to do and he'll obey us and we're going to command nations? Dream along with me. He's going to have people who have learned his ways, do things his ways, and they are qualified to rule. If that wasn't the case, we'd have the same mess we already have then. He's going to have a company of people who have overcome and they and they alone are going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And who are the nations? The foolish virgins who wouldn't get the anointing and do things his way when they had the chance. Verse 30 of Luke, he says this, Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, when the apocalypse takes place. The people of Sodom were destroyed when Lot went out, and it will be that way when the Lord comes back. When the Son of Man is revealed, when the apocalypse takes place, when the manifestation takes place, when the revelation takes place, it's going to be like that then. He's not saying that the righteous are going to go out and that there's going to be two in a field, one taken and one left. And I'm going to show you beyond any doubt that's not what this says. If you want to believe it after I show you, you're free to do it. He says this is going to take place. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. When the apocalypse takes place. When the manifestation takes place. In that day when the manifestation takes place. He was on the housetop and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take away anything. And likewise the one who was in the field let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. Who are these people who are told not to go back into their house? The same ones he said in the foolish virgins 
Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Son of Man comes. Remember, there's a wedding supper that takes place between the rapture of the bride and the coming of the Lord, the revelation of the Lord. The foolish virgins have already missed the wedding. They weren't ready. And they are told to be watching for the return, the coming, the manifestation, the apocalypse. They are to be waiting for his appearing. They're going to be on the earth because of their worldliness. They're going to be still here because of their carnality and because of their lukewarmness. They're going to be spewed out of their mouth and not part of the wedding because they weren't ready. They weren't overcomers. They didn't set their heart to buy oil. They were holding back things from God. And like I said to you last week, a perfect heart is not a heart that has everything straight. It's a heart that doesn't hold back anything from God. What are you holding back right now? Anybody holding back from God is not ready for the wedding. The cares of this world and the love of this world and their carnality has caused them to love something more than the appearing of Jesus in the wedding. And let me tell you something. I can't imagine wanting to be married to somebody. If I was standing here at the altar in 1969 like I was and my wife Sharon began to walk down that aisle and she's looking around at everybody and kind of looking back and, and her whole attention was just completely bored. I'd have walked back in that office and escaped through the window. I wouldn't want to be married to somebody who was just coming to the wedding because it was time. I want somebody who wanted to live with me and live out her life with me and raise my family with me and be committed to the vows we made. You think Jesus is going to come back for a bride that's carnal and lukewarm and worldly and, and having idols and other gods and, and living, watching TV for 6, 8, 10, 12, 15, 40 hours a week and thinking they're serving Jesus? Dream on with me, it's not going to happen. Just isn't going to happen. They're going to miss the wedding. And they're going to come pounding on the door. Lord, let us in. Let us in. Lord, Lord. I don't know you. You have no intimacy with me at all. You're not ready to be my bride. You're ready to have my bride who's going to sit on the throne with me rule over you. Watch therefore for you don't know when I'm coming back from this wedding. And when I come back the next time, you better be more ready than you are this time. In that day. In what day? In the day of his coming. In the day of his revelation. In the day of his apocalypse. The warning here is for those who missed the rapture. Those who have already been disqualified from being in the marriage. These are not enemies with God. These are not enemies of God. They're just foolish. They weren't ready for the wedding. I have a speculation. I say this very openly. It's a speculation. Daniel speaks of a 45-day period that seems to be possibly the explanation of when the marriage supper takes place. Because he speaks of a time of 1,290 days. And then he says, Blessed is he, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, and from the time that the daily is taken away, and the word sacrifice is not there. It means the daily prayer. That's why we've got this temple being built over in Jerusalem, because they stuck a word in there based on whatever reason they did it. The word sacrifice isn't even in the Hebrew. It just says when the daily is taken away, and the daily is going on every day in Jerusalem at the wall, as we've already seen. And when that daily prayer is stopped, and the Gentiles begin trotting underfoot the city of Jerusalem for 42 months. And let me assure you, when the Gentiles are trotting under the city of Jerusalem for 42 months, there isn't going to be any temple built. There's already a temple on that mountain. And if there's going to be a sacrifice offered, it'll probably be offered in that temple. Which I don't believe there will be a sacrifice. I believe the daily is going to be taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up. There will be 1,260 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335th day. There's a 45-day period in there where the Lord says, there's 1,290 days, but then blessed is the man who survives till the 1,335th day. Of course, blessed is the man who survives. Satan's going to know his time is short. He's going to go out like a roaring lion. And those last 30, 45 days of this world before Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom are going to be the worst days this world has ever known. Blessed is the man who survives. Blessed is the man who's watching and waiting. Blessed is the man who doesn't give up the ship of calling him Lord. Blessed are those foolish virgins who hold on, knowing it's a short time when he's coming back. There are now, instead of being careless, lukewarm, carnal, worldly Christians, they're hanging on for their life for the coming. 
The emphasis in this section in Luke 17 is on in that day, the day of his coming. Let me say this to you quite frankly. It is completely unreasonable to me to think that when the Lord's trumpet sounds, the angels are shouting, the archangel is declaring the coming of the Lord, the Lord himself is shouting, and he's gathering us, and we are changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we are on our way out of this world to be at the wedding supper that we would think of going back to our house for any reason. Now just tell me something. If you heard the sound of the trumpet and you heard the voice of the archangel and the rapture started to take place and I've wondered for years what in the world would cause anybody to think of something in there. What do you need? Your bank account? What in the world could be in the house that would cause anyone who's on the rooftop to want to leave the call to the second coming and go down to get something I'm convinced that anybody who's ready for the rapture would have absolutely nothing in this life between them and their Lord. But I have no problem believing foolish virgins will have all sorts of things between them and their Lord because foolish virgins live that way. Do you understand what I'm saying? So then when the Lord says, watch because I'm coming back after the marriage is over, I can imagine that statement having a lot of impact because now you are talking to people who already missed the rapture because of their carnality. They've already lost the biggest blessing in the world, being married to the Son of the living God. And now the Lord says, I'm saying to you, watch, and when this, when the second coming takes place and I do return, don't you dare go down to get something out of your house because if you do... You will have proved you're with the wicked and you don't love my appearing at all and you will die with the wicked who do not obey my gospel at all. I tell you in that night there will be two men in a bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinded together. The one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 24. For as in the days of before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And as Luke says, it destroyed them all. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. This is not the rapture. This is the coming after the wedding. Now, In case you don't believe what I'm saying, just to put the final seal on this truth. Notice the very next verse. Luke 17, 37. And they, the disciples, said to him, Where, Lord? Now, how many of you, ask the question, where are the ones taken taken to? Where are they taken to? The disciples were pretty perceptive men, quite frankly, far more perceptive than we are. And when he tells them all this story, the first thing they say is, where are they being taken to? Look at the answer. Wherever the cadaver is, is what that word means, there the eagles will be gathered together. Tell me, where is the feast of the vultures? Right after the marriage supper in Revelation 19, after the marriage supper takes place, Jesus comes riding in with his white horse and all the saints on horses with him. And he says, all you angels, call the fowls of the air together because they're going to have a feast. And the feast is going to be on the bodies of kings and captains and armies and the wicked. The disciples say, where is the one taken to going. One shall be taken, the other left. One shall be taken, the other left. One shall be taken, the other left. And their immediate question was, where? And he said, to the feast of the vultures. Where are they taken? To destruction. He just got through saying that. It'll be like in the days of Noah. They entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Two men are going to be in a field. One is going to be grinding. One's taking the other left. Two men here, two men there, two women here, two women there. One's taking the other left. Lord, where are they going to be taken to? To the feast of the vultures. 
Who's destroyed at the feast of the altars? All the wicked at his coming. Do you see how we have taken scripture? It's so plain. He tells the whole story about taking and left and taking and left and the coming, the coming, days of Noah. And then he says, and then when that happens, it'll be like 10 virgins. There'll be a marriage supper. Five go to the marriage supper. Five are left. And when the five are left, they're wanting to get into the marriage supper. And when they try to get in, he says, you're not getting in. You've missed it. But watch for you know not what hour the son of man comes. You know who's not going to have any idea of the day and of the hour? The carnal, lukewarm, worldly Christians who think they're ready for the rapture and they're not walking one bit in present day obedience. They're not walking in obedient faith. They're just walking along calling Jesus Lord. Jesus is my Lord. I love Jesus. I don't keep his commandments. Let me tell you something. If you don't keep his commandments, you don't love him. Either that's true or the Bible's a lie. And if I'm going to choose whether you're lying or the Bible's lying, I think I will choose the Bible telling the truth and the person saying they love Jesus who isn't keeping his commandments is the liar. The second coming is coming upon us. There's a day coming real soon when there's going to be a rapture and the trumpet's going to sound. And those who are ready to go out and the wise virgins whose lamps are full of oil and they're, they're waiting, they're longing, their hearts meet with the Lord. They love his appearing and morning by morning and night after night, day after day, they're seeking him. They're looking toward him. They're holding back nothing. He puts his finger on something and they just simply surrender because they're walking in obedient faith and their hearts longing for the coming of Jesus. And one day there's going to be a sound and they're going to ascend after this uh, by faith, by faith. They're going to hear the voice. Let me just say this in passing. By faith, Enoch was translated. You know what faith is? Faith comes by hearing a word from the Lord. Nobody's going to be raptured that doesn't hear his voice to come up hither. The idea that we're just going to all just automatically hear the voice. <laughs> Man, I have been in situations where I'm hearing God's voice. And I'm looking around at brothers and sisters around me. And no one is even aware that there's a problem going on. And I'm hearing his voice. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. I hear his voice. Don't go out to that. That man's a false prophet. Don't go there. And other Christians say, oh, he's wonderful. Now either I'm totally deceived or they are. We're going to be raptured by faith. How does faith come? We're going to hear the voice. Come up hither. We don't hear that voice. We're not going anywhere. And a carnal, lukewarm, calloused, worldly Christian hear his voice, they don't even believe you can. Do you realize how much of the church doesn't even believe you can hear God's voice anymore? The devil's really deceived us into teaching that. Over 3,800 times in the Bible it speaks of God speaking, but all of a sudden he decided to quit talking. That's amazing to me. Let me tell you something. I've heard his voice. I've heard it so loud that I honestly cannot tell you whether it was audible or unaudible. It was that loud. I've heard his voice. I've tasted of what it is to hear his voice. And one day I want to hear the voice. Come up hither. The marriage supper of the Lamb has come. But those who are foolish, they're going to miss it. And then when they try to get in, he's going to say, no, you're not coming in. You don't have the wedding garment. You're not ready. You don't have any oil. You don't have any anointing. You haven't sought me. You've done your own thing. You've been more concerned over your bank account and your retirement than you were the glorious rapture, the glorious second coming. You've been more concerned about doing your own thing in your vacations than you were preparing for the second coming. You're not going to be part. But I'm coming back to this earth. And you can be part of the second coming, the, the actual kingdom, if you watch. If you watch. But be careful that you watch. Because you don't know when I'm coming back. And when I come back, there's going to be two in a field. One's taken, the other left. And when I come back, don't go down in the house to get something. Because you will be qualified to be judged like Lot's wife was. Does that make any sense to you? Does that make more sense than maybe the fact that that one taken left is the rapture? Let me tell you something. One day I realized those taken were taken and destroyed. And I said, whoever they are, I don't want to be part. Into that. They're taken and destroyed, don't want to be part. 
That's what Luke says. And the flood came and destroyed them all, which is an exact quote of what Matthew says, and the flood came and took them all away. And when I saw that the ones taken are destroyed, I said, Lord, whoever they are, I don't want to be part, but make me understand how this fits together. And after 30 years, I'm beginning to get a better sense of how it all fits together. I've been studying it and looking at it and listening to it and trying to absorb it for 30 years. And for the first time, I feel like I got a little handle on some of these events. The parable of the tares. Let me quote that before I end. When the disciples said, where are you taking the ones taken? He says, wherever the body is there, the eagles will be gathered. And we've already read Armageddon that he says in chapter 19 of Revelation verses 7 and 8 that it's going to be the birds that fly are going to come from the midst of heaven and gather at this great supper of the great God. But there's this little parable about the wheat and the tares. In Matthew 13, he gives us the interpretation of the parable of the wheat and the tares. He says, this is the interpretation. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them. So the ones gathered first are burned. And the wheat gather into my barn. You should see some of the pre-tribulation rapture teachers do fancy footwork trying to explain what that verse means. Gather first the tares and bind them into bundles and burn them. You know, I don't try to bend my doctrine to fit the word. I try to find out the word is saying and bend my doctrine to meet the word. The first ones gathered are the tares. Now, I don't care what you believe, and if you want to believe that the first one gathers at the rapture or the, the wheat's taken out and caught up to be with the Lord, and, and that's what he's referring to here, he says, no, the first gathered at the harvest, at the second coming, when I take over the world, the first to be gathered are going to be the tares, because there'll be two in the field, one will be taken, the other left, and the one taken is destroyed. And let me just say this in logic, in the days of Noah, who was left? Noah was the only one left with his family. He was left. The rest were destroyed. And that's what's going to happen in the last day. The only ones left will be those who believe in Jesus. But only those going up in the rapture are those who are ready to be married to the bridegroom because they have made themselves ready by the righteous acts of the saints. What are the first two things we're to be doing to get ready? Number one, we are to be pursuing personal holiness and we are to be walking in obedient faith, hearing what he's saying and doing it, or we will not be ready for the second coming. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the coming that is drawing nigh. Lord, the closer we get to that day, our hearts long, long for the day when Jesus appears puts down murder and theft and rape and violence and hatred and brings an end to this world system and the corruption from the top to the bottom and sets up a righteous kingdom wherein the horse's bridles will declare holiness unto the Lord. We want to be part of that kingdom. Father, we want to please you in all that we say and all that we do. Set before us the fear of God where we realize that you're watching and weighing the words and thoughts and attitudes and actions and motives of our heart. And conform us to the precious image of Jesus. If there's any here today that are walking in areas of disobedience, holding back, being resistant to what you're speaking to them. In Jesus' name I pray that you will give them the grace to choose your way. Cause them to have the hope of the second coming and the, the rapture of the church and the marriage supper of the Lamb before their eyes and that they would purify themselves with that hope ever before them. Purify all of us. And may this congregation of believers join with that congregation throughout the world who are preparing for your coming, who are wise virgins, buying the oil now, buying the truth now through whatever means you give to us that we would meet with you and be changed and be prepared for that glorious wedding. 
pray that you will move upon our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. You have been listening to Kingdom Living with Pastor Mark Byers, sponsored by Calvary Christian Church. Thank you for listening today, and we encourage you to join us again next time as we return to God's Word and study along with Pastor Mark Byers right here on Kingdom Living.